This episode is brought to you by Kanye West and his inspirational quote. Yeah, that tuxedo might have been a little guido, but with my ego, I can stand there in the speedo and be looked at like a fucking hero. Welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast, my people. People, ¿Cómo están, damas y caballeros? Welcome to the Stephen Dyer Podcast, where I welcome people with remarkable stories for amazingly vulnerable conversation. This episode with Amara Saran make me, made me feel bulletproof, no joke. Amara sounds like nothing in life can hurt you if you are sure of who you are. Now, that process could take time. But when you hear him talk, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Amar is the co-founder of 366 Fit, Clubhouse Toronto, and Taha Academy in Ontario, Canada. He is also a very successful entrepreneur and a distributor for Herbalife Nutrition, an institution he speaks very highly of. The most beautiful thing about this episode, to me, was the recurring theme of self-love, family, mental health, resilience, and self-awareness. Mainly self-awareness. Even when, an Amar, even when Amar talks about growing up, or even being in prison, coming out, making mistakes, getting back up, starting businesses, now starting a family, getting married, these recurring themes never leave. The love for his mom and his sister and his family just... I mean, it was beautiful. I'm really excited for you to listen to this episode. I don't want to tell you anything else because it will be a roller coaster ride of emotions. If you're listening to this episode on Spotify or watching the video on YouTube and you want to leave us a comment, review, like, and or subscribe, we would really appreciate it. Tell us actually in the comments, like during the episode and after the episode, what you really liked because... It'll be beautiful to read. And even more brownie points, if you like the episode, then share it on your Instagram stories and tag us, actually, at Stefan Dyer and at Mr. MR, MR underscore 366. That's MR's Instagram. All right, my friends, he's a dad. He's an entrepreneur. He's a visionary. Please enjoy this episode with MR like I know you will in three Two, one, go. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast. I have here the unbreakable, the unmistakable, the highly capable, <laughs> the main man with a David Bowie t-shirt that I love. Amar, how are you, my brother? I'm phenomenal. And yourself? Good, man. I'm so excited to have you. I was I was reading up about you um, online. I I know you through our mutual friend uh, Alex Biwara, who was on this podcast. Great guy, phenomenal, incredible story, and you have an insane story too. I want to thank you even before we start because we've postponed this like three times because my son got sick. I had to go to the hospital months ago. Then you you had a situation with your yeah. with your kids too, and then we've been trying to reschedule it, and then we finally did it man so thank you for the patience no problem best things come to those who wait yes yes listen i was reading up about you and i tremendously admire your story i feel like we have a lot of things in common where we are both immigrants we are both uh have parents that are not from the country that they lived for a long time. So your your mom, your parents are from India. Your mom is from India. She had to come here. Uh, I grew up in Costa Rica, but my parents are Peruvian. And both our childhoods had a lot of events that shaped who we are. And I couldn't believe your story when I was reading it. So let's let's just give it a start. You were born in India. Raised in Scarborough in the 90s, minority amongst minorities, 
single parent household, and you were the the oldest of the three three kids, two youngest sisters. What was that experience like growing up in that environment? And this was like what really impressed me. How did you end up working at age twelve and living on your own, sleeping on the floor at age sixteen? Um. Hmm. So at age twelve, I just honestly I lied on my on my application about my age. It was for a grocery store. They're not gonna check thoroughly. <laughs> I was like, okay, I seen. I was going back to school, and I seen all these kids have all these different things, and I was like, I didn't want to ask my mom, so I just went and got a job, so I could take off some of that pressure of my school tickets and all these things. That's amazing. When you. When you came to Canada, how old were you? Were you? I came here when I was a baby. I came here when I was like two, so I don't have much upbringing in India. Yeah, but because my household was so Punjabi influenced, I actually had to go to ESL, even though I was here, like raised here in Canada. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Sometimes, like people assume that people can't speak English just because of the way they look. Yeah, and then that really kind of shapes uh, who you are because. Sometimes you you don't feel seen, you don't feel heard, you 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 get treated like you're dumb sometimes, and uh, it's it's not fair. Where in Ontario did you grow up, and what was that like? I grew up in Scarborough. We migrated straight to Scarborough. We landed. I think we lived at Kennedy and Eglinton, and then moved to Kennedy in four hundred one for sixteen, seventeen years of my life. I lived there. We've talked behind the scenes that. <laughs> That for people in India or Latin America, like Scarborough is like a really good place. It's phenomenal. But, but lo- locally... It has a bad rap. It, it has a bad rap. And, and was it a rough neighborhood you growing up? Was it a shitty place to, to, to be? Or, or was it okay? It all depends. There were certain pockets of the neighborhood which were not friendly at all. And then the other parts of the neighborhood was just a typical neighborhood, school, grocery store, X, Y, Z. But there was certain parts, especially right where the core buildings were. Yeah. It wasn't the greatest environment to raise a family and that, that I could say for sure. I noticed in um, one of the things that I read about you that you ended up living in a battered women's shelter. Yes. Due to domestic violence. If If you're comfortable talking about it... What series of events leaded to you and your family living there? So, especially in a lot of cultures, divorce and separation was very taboo in the 80s and 90s. So in a household, I look at it, women would take uh, domestic abuse, verbal or physical, and not say anything, right? So I guess it just got to a, a, a boiling point where my mom's like, I got to think of the safety and security of my children and myself. And she took an aggressive step, which was very beneficial and safe for us. So my sister lived with my grandparents, and me and my mom lived at a better women's shelter for, for for a few months. Wow. Your your grandparents also lived in Canada? Yes. So my grandparents migrated to Canada, I think, seven years after we got here. Wow. Once you go over these these events and, and these events pass... As a teenager, you've mentioned in the past that your your mom's mental health deteriorated. You get arrested for the first time, and you you start dealing with drugs. On top of that, your your girlfriend is at that time is is pregnant. Your family's not doing well. What's going through your mind, and what was the game plan at that time? Because it's it sounds very hectic. You know what? Now that I've had time to think about it. It was so long ago. I think I was dealing with so many different traumas, just didn't know how to cope with them. So I was like, instantaneously, this is happening to my mom. I got to be there to support her. I got to take care of my sisters. I got to find ways to earn uh, income so we can pay our bills. I can pay my own bills. And then I had a a girlfriend at the time made a very ill-advised decision and she got pregnant. And then that was the icing on the cake. And I was like, oh, my God, I got to make more money. And then I ended up in an industry that I down looked on my entire life. I never planned or wanted to be a drug dealer. I never thought it was cool. But I just knew it was a quick way to make money. 
and I just dove into it head first and started building from there. And I believe God has a way of doing things on its own. And the girlfriend didn't end up having the child. She had a miscarriage. Wow. So that was his sign of like, hey, this isn't for you. Or the way I viewed it is, hey, you're going to go and sell drugs. I can't give you the gift of life. So I guess I don't, I don't know how to break it down, but he did what he thought was best. It seems to me that coming from conservative cultures and households like the uh, Punjabi and the Latino, and from our conversation, you were here when, when I interviewed Alex Bivar, that Latino parents and Punjabi parents would be like really pissed off that their kids are dealing drugs or doing things. And growing up in Scarborough and maybe within the Punjabi uh, scene or like other people talk like Latinos are very gossipy they, and I, I imagine Punjabi maybe as well because it's a very conservative society was it l frowned upon when they found out that you were doing these things I think in every culture it's frowned upon yeah, right <laughs> but I think individuals that are second third generation in Canada and they have a bigger family things have been done so what my mom always used to say is Sure, family members are going to judge you, but they don't understand you. Yeah. Their kids haven't matured yet, so they look at you like you're a black sheep. So once their kids get older, they start drinking and going out and doing things. Then they'll not be so as judgmental. But in the beginning, everybody was very harsh. But I hit it really well. I'm not a individual that likes to live the limelight. Yeah. Or I don't like to force living the limelight. If things happen organically, I'm cool with it. But I've never gone like, hey, da, 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 to show something that wasn't necessary. I've never been, uh, there's no advertisement of that lifestyle with me. I always kept it very hush-hush. And growing up where I grew up, I didn't have any Punjabi friends. Oh, okay. So I was either with the Caribbeans or the Sri Lankans. There was no <laughs> Punjabis in my neighborhood. So no way, there so was no judgment from those, uh, from my own people. I'm always really interested in the um, internal dialogue. I know that initially you didn't view your criminal lifestyle as a business. It was like, oh, I'm just getting some cash. But then you started seeing it as a business. When did this change? And what sort of decisions did you make to take it to the next level as a business? So I got into a, a high-speed chase one night. <laughs> got into a car accident. Walked away with just a little scratch. And once I had served everything that came with losing my license, going to jail for it, and all of that, that came with that case. Uh, I remember my friend, he's from Chile. He came to live with me from Calgary. And I told him, I was like, my birthday is coming in 11 weeks. I'm going to make an X amount of dollars. I'm going to put it away in case I get in trouble. And then the next amount, I'm going to save it to reinvest in myself. And I'm not looking back. And I hit my target and then after that i was just like i gotta come up with a game plan i gotta have an exit strategy and i just gotta figure out what i'm going to do and how i'm going to get out because this is not a long-term solution that's amazing that's amazing so let me get this straight so you were you were in it my my birthday's in 11 weeks you're with your boy in chile what was so you you knew that this wasn't a long-term thing no and what was the exit plan and how did it go wrong i was like 21 and i was like i'm gonna retire when i'm 35 i'm gonna give myself 14 year run but i wasn't planning for the authorities or anything i was being a bit naive so oh so the exit strategy was like a, a 15 year exit strategy yeah 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 oh yeah, yeah. i thought it was like a six week thing no 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 oh no 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 i was in it for i was gonna make it my career and business for a prolonged period of time and, and what then was What was the exit. goal? What was the goal? Like the, the, the money that you wanted to put aside and the money? Just, uh, you can't say it was anything concrete, but just the first things that you know, hey, I'm going to open a business and I'm going to buy property. Oh, I get it. Right? If it was the modern time this year, this, this day and age, I would literally take everything I have and invest into cryptocurrency and property. Oh, I love it, man. So, <laughs> I'm... After you decide, okay, this is going to be the exit strategy, you take the business really hard, 
Yeah, uh, really seriously. Yeah. At age 23, 24, something else happens. And yeah. the cops started to, to to follow you. What happened next? I think the cops, well, not think, I know the cops were following me for over a year. Wow. Because of individuals that I was hanging out with. So not because of what I was doing. It's because of the things that they were doing. And just because you're all friends, you don't know what this guy does or that guy does or that guy does in their spare time or how they operate. You just, under the assumption that, hey, I'm very low-key, I'm very safe, and I'm very particular, I, I would assume they are too, but most people aren't. So because of the things that they were doing, I draw attention to myself, and then it's a domino effect, right? That's insane. And then... I noticed in the in reading up about you that you, there was a raid. Yeah. And you go to trial and prison. What was that event like? And did it grab you by surprise? No. From the time that I had originally got charged and the time that I, I had gotten sentenced, there was a three-year gap. Wow. So... Because I had gone to jail, I had gotten bail. We postponed my bail, waited about three weeks to get everything in order. And then I got bail, came back out and went back to work. And then when I went to trial, I knew that I was going to go to, I was going to go away. I'd even contemplated like, I can't do all this time. I'm leaving the country. No way. And then my sister's like, if you leave, you're going to run forever. And then you won't be able to see us. That's. And then I was like, okay, I just got to man up and take whatever they throw at me and then everything worked out in my favor they didn't get what they were looking for we got something in our favor and one thing i can say if i didn't go to prison right now i'd probably be dead or i'd be looking at a very lengthy sentence so prison was the best thing that ever happened to me that's incredible man what what was the impact on your family catastrophic catastrophic imagine being the male figure for your mom and your sisters you're from a young age my grandmother would tell me like eight nine years old you're the man of the house so in my mind i was looked at it i'm my mother's son but i also got to play the role of the husband in a sense and i got two sisters i'm their older brother i also got to be their friend but i also got to play the father figure role so there was like such a so many different hats and it's just one amar and then when i went away it affected it affected them i can't even put it into words but that was probably the first day when i went in for those first few hours and i seen my sister breaking down that was probably the hardest one day and then i had probably maybe two other hard days in my entire sentence everything else was whatever wow What was the conversation, like the internal dialogue in yourself when you go into prison? You see the impact that it's having on, on your family. Is it like super pissed at the cops? Is it, I'm going to make a change? Is it relief? Like uh, Alex said when he got, when he got those uh, nine years, that is like, oh, I'm so happy that I'm not going to be out here anymore. What was... What was going through your mind that were the building blocks for you to then make a change? For me, I've never really lived a lifestyle of extreme stress or anxiety. I've always tried to foresee things. So when the walls did crash, come crashing down, it was inevitable. So that didn't bother me. Was I pissed at the cops? No, they're doing their job. Did I have a little fun with them in the interrogation room? 100%. <laughs> He, you had fun with them? One guy came in there and he's like, we've been looking to get you for a long time. And he's like, I was a constable at the time. And he goes, I'm a detective now. I was like, wow, you got promoted. Good for you. And I just went back to sleep because I literally had nothing to say. <laughs> get me to my lawyer, get me my bail, and then we're going to figure out how to handle the case. But I couldn't be mad at them. They're doing their job. What I was mad at was myself because I did things that I shouldn't have done. I got too complacent. I, like I said prior, 
I thought because I move very diligently, I expected others to. So I can't blame others for what they do or don't do. This was, I was my own demise. I said, I can't put it on anybody else. I was my own downfall. I can't be mad at the cops. They're doing their job. You're not out there selling um, supplements or, or, or you're, you're pushing the Bible. You're out there living an illicit lifestyle. You sell drugs with guns or whatever it is you're doing. Cops come. It's your fault, buddy. Nobody else's. So I couldn't be mad at them. When you go into <laughs> when you go into prison, you end up doing thirty five months. For somebody who's never been in jail, I don't know what it's like. What did you do there, and how did you say like, okay, I'm gonna take advantage of this time because I know that when I leave, I want to do something that is not the same that I did before. I don't want to be back here. So, excuse me. One thing I realized during my sentence is, and it's no disrespect to the people that live that lifestyle that are in there, but who I considered my peers, the mindset on what they were looking to do and the lifestyle they're living is very different from my set and the lifestyle that I was living. I don't consider myself a, just because you sell drugs or carry a gun or live that lifestyle doesn't mean you're a gangster. I've never been a gangster. I don't want to be qualified as a gangster. I'm strictly here for the capital gains. That's it. So I realized that these guys, a lot of them are caught up in the narrative of what hip hop has portrayed. Yeah. And I'm not, yeah, sure. I like, I like the hip hop culture. I like the music. I like the dancing X, Y, Z, but I'm not a gangster. I'm here for the money. So I was like, that's one thing I learned. I was like, these guys, we're, we're cool with each other, but we're not peers. So I separated myself in that sense. And what I did with my time, I used to be athletic when I was growing up. I was still athletic in my 20s. And I was like, damn, I'm a little bit overweight because I'm always on my car, doing business, this and that. So I didn't care. I had a gym membership, never used it. <laughs> yeah, like most So I, of I went in there. I started running. I started reading about... Um, the mind. So I got heavy into psychology. Neuroscience. Yeah, I got into uh, learning about serotonin, dopamine. I started to learn about sibling psychology, single parent households. So I spent a lot of time reading about family psychology. So when I eventually have a family, what I can do to come out and help my sisters, my mom, all of us deal with everything. And then when I have kids on how to communicate with them, instead of trying to I don't believe on being your kid's friend, like how it's promoted nowadays. I believe on being a parent, but I believe on being open and understanding to the times because I believe when my mom came here, she brought a, a lot of the Indian values and the Indian way of living, but we're not in India anymore. That's so interesting. <clears throat> so my mom was a little bit ahead of her time and she's like understood that kids do these things and make mistakes and you got to communicate and be open. Other families, they're not like that. They're like, we're, we're Indian or we're this and we're that and we're going to stick to that. No, you're in Canada now and you have to take a little bit from the Canadian culture. Yeah. And makes the integration of the two worlds a lot easier. I've always had uh, trouble with that. And I agree totally with you. I've, I've had uh, myself, I've had a bit of a identity crisis because born in Costa Rica parents are peruvian so i wasn't costa rican because my per my household was peruvian and i wasn't like eating the things that costa ricans were eating at home because my mom is peruvian you know yeah. uh we I, i said words that were necessarily costa rican so but when i went to peru to see my grandparents i wasn't peruvian because i was born in costa rica then i moved to el salvador clearly not salvadorian mexico obviously not mexican Then Quebec, clearly not Quebecois, and Toronto. Toronto, That's a nice little journey, man. Yeah. Yeah, Toronto, ironically, has been one of the places because of the melting pot of cultures where I kind of feel more at home, especially now because of I have my home with my wife and my son. But since nobody's home, I'm like, oh, this is home because <laughs> I've never felt home as much. Did you ever feel like a fish out of water? Um, I felt a f like a fish out of water, I guess. Uh, <laughs> my entire life till I was probably about a teenager when I really came into who I was and who I wanted to be. 
because when you're younger, you don't know. You're yeah. just kind of, you might have leadership qualities, but you don't know you're a leader or you're just following the pack or you're doing things, not really knowing what you're doing. Because, because I was Indian, the Sri Lankans had issues with me and I was cool because I was cool with the blacks. And then the, because uh, I wasn't black or I wasn't Caribbean, some of them had issues with me too. So I was always <laughs> like kind of on my own. But the way you said it, Toronto is a melting pot. I actually use that term to describe us as well. Because we have such an amalgamation, so many different cultures here. You can go to a Caribbean restaurant and then an Eastern European walks in. Yeah. I'm like, oh, let me get the jerk chicken, da 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 And then you go to a, a Hispanic restaurant and you'll catch an Indian person in there. Definitely. And you go to an Indian restaurant and you'll catch an Hispanic and a, and a Canadian in there. It's so crazy. I love it. Yeah. So here, like it, here I, I believe we have so much diversity and it's so welcomed. It's amazing. I don't think other parts of the world have it like we do, in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's Toronto and New York are up there. I do feel like it's almost like going to school all over again, but to learn things that are actually useful. For example, until I lived in Toronto, I didn't know that Brazil has a big Japanese population. Because I see like a Japanese guy, I'm like, oh, you're from Japan. He's like, no, I'm from Brazil. And I'm like, what? There's a lot of Japanese people in Brazil, same as in Peru. Chifa is a very popular Peruvian Chinese cuisine. And there's a lot of Chinese and Japanese people in Peru to the point that one of the ex-presidents was fully Japanese, Fujimori. I didn't know so interesting. that there's a big Indian population in Trinidad. Like, I would have never guessed that because when Costa Rica plays Trinidad, it's mostly like, in, like the Trinidadian team is mostly black people. But then you, you learn these things. I I didn't know, well, a lot of people didn't know that in Costa Rica, there's a big Jamaican population. I would never have imagined that. There's either. a, one of the seven provinces is called Limon. And years ago, a big, big Jamaican population came to work locally and they stayed. So Limon is like if it, they speak Patois, it's a lot of black population, Jamaican, very, very, it's, it's in the Caribbean side of Costa Rica. So you get to learn a lot of these things that you would have never imagined or you would have never known if you stayed in Costa Rica, if you stayed in India. So it's it really helps you open your mind and be more empathetic, I believe, in many ways. You get released on parole. You have lost about 40 pounds because you were working out. You were learning about different things in, in, in prison. And you go to Vancouver yeah. to finish your parole. What was that like? So I'd never been to BC before. I've never been. I, I it, heard it's beautiful. You know what? Um, my opinion, I think it's the best place to raise kids and raise a family in Canada, hands down. How so? A, the weather is great. So you, yourself, and your kids will spend more time outside yeah. instead of inside in a condo or have your kid in front of a box or a TV or a screen because people are very outdoorsy out there. Yeah. I think Vancouver is safer than Toronto. Less population, less hectic. And I just love the fact that there's so much. I can drive up. I can go to Whistler three, four hours. You can get the Rocky Mountains. Not the Rocky Mountains, sorry. Um skiing and like then you can banff. come down banff everything is close like louise lake louise i haven't been there yet but i like the fact that you have so many options in vancouver and it's a very slow compared to toronto and the people are more friendly out there i know this is a vague question and it's very abstract but i'm a big fan of self-awareness i think self-awareness is the biggest gift that you can give yourself like gary v always says and I'm really curious as to what you discovered about yourself. What did you learn about yourself in prison and as you were finishing your parole? So one thing I learned, I knew that I had to, A, break the cycle. If I moved back to Toronto, I would have completed my parole and went right back to work, 100%. So I went there. And by the virtue of being away for so long, people who, who were business partners essentially became less and less and less, 
right? So I wasn't tempted to go back to that so lifestyle. Good. It's very easy for me or for other people that have lived that lifestyle. And I realized that if, if you're going to be in a career field, you're judged by your peers. Yeah. And I didn't want to be judged that, oh, this guy does this and this guy does that. He shot people. He sells drugs. And like, that's not who I am. That's what I've did to earn money. But that's not who I am. That's not what I want to be associated with for the rest of my life. So I had to separate, make a hard break from that. Because growing up, I think teachers and people always tell you, hey, you're destined for something so much bigger. But I never took it serious. So then I took it serious. And then I, I'd lost weight. I'd gotten very smart mentally in terms of uh, from a psychological aspect. And then I realized that serotonin and dopamine can actually help you survive anything and how you condition yourself and the affirmations you tell yourself. Like, so good. So I used to have an affirmation before I went to sleep prior to me going to prison. And then when I was there. What, what was that? Oh, um, it just had something to do with my. I just used to refer to myself as the best drug dealer and then go to sleep every night. And then when I'd wake up, naturally, I'd have more sales. So that's why, how I would equate it in my mind. And then when I went away, regardless of the type of day that I was having inside, high or low, people always ask you how you're doing. And I told them, I go, yo, I'm good. I'm always good. So if you keep telling yourself that, it doesn't matter what happens, you're going to survive. My mom taught me what you're going through now, yesterday or 10 years ago, there's 7 billion people on this planet. There's somebody else out there that went through what you went through and they survived. So just relax. It's going to be okay. You're going to be good. So I've always, A, used that for myself and I use that and I try to teach that to other people because people get so rattled nowadays with um, anxiety or depression or a situation arises and they don't know what to do. Just just relax. There's no There's no gun to your head. Just, just step out of the situation, calm down, and know that it's going to be okay. When you go to sleep on this Thursday, and you had a huge, very bad day, when you wake up tomorrow, you're born again. And you have another opportunity to fix what happened or have a better way to handle it. That's it. Yeah, There's... just your voice calms me down. <laughs> you have a very, like, calming voice. You pause... As a communication coach, it's a very, very good voice to communicate, guys, to your team as a leader. Guys, we're doing good or we're doing bad. We can get better. But it's not like, fuck you guys. Shut the fuck. Like, it's it's calming. It, it, it also, the audience is usually a reflection of you. So if you are calm, it usually has that effect on other people. Definitely. So me, in my mind, I consider my, because there's an alpha or a beta, I consider myself the big dog's big dog. I don't care who you are, what you think you are. I will mentally annihilate you. You might be physically <laughs> yes. bigger than me, but I'll, I'll win the mental battle. So I always try to remain calm and very even keel. I have an aggressive personality too, but I've learned to leave my aggression and my ego at the door so I can learn how to be a better leader and a better listener because everybody has their own style of da 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 and they'll be like uh, very explosive. That works for them. And then there's other styles where you're calm, cool, collective, and you're just even keel because like you said, your, your team or your organization is a reflection of you. So if I want to be a good leader and a good listener, I got to teach people how to do that by leading by example. Also, if I'm always expecting you to flip out on me, You're I'm not gonna never going to tell you things. If I'm if I'm expecting my leader or my boss, if I if I messed up, and I have to go tell Amar that I messed up, but Amar always explodes. I don't want to tell Amar. No, but you do sound like a guy that like okay, guys, um, what happened? How can we make this better? And uh, I mean, I don't know how you are as a boss, but. Like tonality wise, it it is very soothing, like calming. Thank you. Um, not as a boss, I I don't consider myself a boss. I consider myself a team lead, right? 
if I need to get down on the ground and help help the team clean, I'm going to get down on the ground and help the team clean. People put me in the position of a boss, but I just want to be like everybody else. Because if we're all on the same page, we can all grow together, right? Some people look for the title of being the boss and the head honcho. That's not, that's just something I know I'm organically am, but I don't need to display it, if that makes sense. It seems to me like the definition of a, of the top dog of the top dogs would be someone with a calm personality. Because everybody's like, yeah, no, I'm the best. It's like, dude, calm down. Like, if you're saying that you're the best, you're not the best. Like, like if you're really sure and and confident, you're not, like, screaming it out loud. You're just the guy in the corner, like, seeing everybody very confident. And if you get asked, you will provide. But, you're like, I feel like the top dog of the top dogs would have your personality. Because... It's like stoic, you know? I'm I'm peaceful, I'm confident, I know we're doing the right thing, and as a result, people will follow me. Definitely. But as an individual who's in a position of leadership, one thing I have learned is not to sugarcoat. Yeah. So I might not be explosive or aggressive, but I definitely won't sugarcoat. So... I deal with men how I expect men to deal with me. Be firm, be straight, be direct. It might come off rude, but it's not rude. It's being firm. The way I was just actually having this conversation earlier today on the way here, and the way that I deal with the females on my team, females are a little bit more gentler. So I don't necessarily sugarcoat, but I don't make it as harsh as I would when I talk to a man. But now as I am more in a position to listen to people, I've learned to figure out different personalities and really speak their language and listen in their language. Definitely. So it's allowed me to shape shift a lot, but still get the same message across with my team. Definitely. That's a great combination of self-awareness and understanding your communication style. We have an exercise at our, at our public speaking school where like, for example, Amar or Alejandro or Mike will go at the front of the room and we all tell them what we perceive of them, what we thought of them the first time we saw them. Because the thing is, you may think people perceive you a certain way, but they don't. You may think you come across a certain way. Like a lot of people think they're charismatic, but everybody hates them. A lot of people think they're uh, super friendly, but ev- like they intimidate everyone. A lot of people think they are super friendly, but everybody thinks they're idiots. So once there's a big gap between how you think people perceive you and how they actually perceive you, it's very hard to be an effective communicator. So kudos to you for knowing your how people perceive you, having that self-awareness, knowing that you're very direct, you don't sugarcoat. So depending on the context, if you're speaking to a man, if you're speaking to a woman, if you're speaking to a grandmother, if you're speaking to a kid, you will maneuver and slightly tweak the delivery, yet not the message. The message needs to be, you still need to get stuff done, but the delivery will help you achieve the objective without necessarily changing what the objective is. Definitely. So I I really like that. Last thing I ever want is someone to mess up on the Monday, and instead of telling me Monday, they're worrying about what I'm going to say, and they wait till Thursday. Yeah. So I tell everybody, if something goes wrong, just tell me. Just be honest. As long as you're honest, I'm actually fairly good at coming up with a solution to solve what we got to solve. If I can't, I know someone on the team can, so we'll always figure it out as a collective. I'm not going to get mad. <laughs> um, this I didn't write this question. This question is not scripted, but you sound so calm. And under control that I'm really curious, like, what was the time of your life where you were, like, this, the most scared of your life? Because you don't come across as a person who would lose her shit. But, I mean, we've all been scared. So, I think the last time I was actually scared was when I was a kid. Very honestly, I was probably scared for me and my mom. That's it. Somebody actually did some courses on how to help people with anxiety and depression and stuff like that. And... People describe them being anxious or what makes them anxious. Nothing makes me anxious. Nothing. I don't, I don't, 
I don't understand what anxiety is because I've never experienced it. Wow. Because like I said, my mom has programmed me to knowing everything's going to be okay. So just be calm. So if I was scared, I was probably scared running from my father. That's it. Like I wasn't scared of going to jail or, oh my God, this guy's going to do something to me. Like, cool. If you're going to do something to me, make sure I don't survive. That's it. Like, Wow. That's it, man. Like, there's, what are you going to do? You're going to beat me up? Cool. You you won that battle, but who are you in the grand scheme of things? Nobody. So I don't really concern myself or worried myself about a lot of people. So I've never really been scared. Did it ever come to blows? Like, come to, like, fights in, in jail or outside of jail where, like, it was, it would have been very I, scary to someone like me, for example? I am not a fighter. Me neither. I've never gone I'm to not, a fight. Because of I, the way I grew up in a, such an aggressive household, I don't like to hit people. I don't even like to box. I'll watch it. It's cool, but it's not my thing. I've usually been fairly good in a confrontational situation to de-escalate it. Sure, I've gotten into a fight in jail. I've gotten into a fight in prison. But because of how much people typically love me, I've never had to really address it myself. Oh. People have almost volunteered to go and do it. They have your back. Yeah, they have my back organically. Not because of what I can provide for them, just because I've been nice with them and listened to them. And when you're a minority amongst minorities, you learn how to be cool with the Haitians, the so Spanish, true. the Jamaicans. So I've been cool with everybody. So sometimes people are intimidated by the fact that you're so neutral with everybody. But I've used that to my advantage. So a guy true. sucker. I, I remember a guy sucker punched me and my friends came and seen me, and they're like, hey, tomorrow morning, this and this is going to happen. I'm like, okay, cool. And then I heard about it. I'm like, hey, fuck, I'm sorry for you, buddy. I left it at that. You make your bed, you lay in it. Wow. When you're, doing, when you're finishing up your parole, you realize that one of the avenues for you to pursue and be successful at was fitness. You go and create a fitness app called 366 Connect to connect with customers, with trained professionals for health and fitness services. What did you learn through this process and how did you put it into practice for your next venture? So this whole fitness concept came about, um, Vancouver is a very fitness yoga oriented city. So when I moved there, I got a membership at the Y. I ended up meeting two Palestinian brothers who were also from Toronto. Yeah. So I ended up, we just ended up clicking, me and the older brother. And he's very brash. He's very egotistical, just like myself. <laughs> and um, one day he sent me a video of him doing something. And I sent him a video of doing the same thing back, but more sets of it. <laughs> so we called it Beasting 366. So he came, I came back to Toronto. I'm like, okay, let's do this fitness thing. Because I knew through fitness, we can heal the mind. Yeah. Right? Because people are like, oh, let me take uh, this to release serotonin and dopamine in my body. May it be drugs or pharmaceutical drugs. But I know that you can run and you can exercise, release the same chemicals. So came back right when the whole app market was booming back in 13, 14. I dumped some money into it. Failed extremely because Instagram has started coming out with their own type of rhythm like that. So me, I tried to do it. You can Instagram come, came up with their what? In, Instagram was huge on fitness and everything too. I couldn't mm. compete with Instagram because Instagram was giving the answer. So what I tried to do was make my app strictly about fitness and fitness competitions and meals and X, Y, Z. But when I didn't, I didn't know anything about marketing or nothing. So that kind of collapsed. And then I was like, okay, let me come up with another concept where I can connect health practitioners, nutritionists, uh, physiotherapists, and put them on an app. But there's apps like that now where you can be like, okay, I'm at um, Young and Lawrence. Let me find professionals for this ailment. And then they would pop up on your feed and then they'll come and see you. Because I lacked the correct knowledge and didn't have a team for marketing, that didn't go anywhere. But I was like, I'm going to stick to the fitness industry, worked for a big gym, First corporate job I ever had did phenomenal at it because it was sales. And I realized that these guys will dispose of you at any given time. There's no culture. There's no community. Yeah. Typically, corporate environments are a cesspool of um, 
behavior that I don't agree with. Females aren't typically respected in corporate environments. In my opinion, there's derogatory jokes. They're almost objectified at times. So once I moved on to bigger and better things, I met with my business partner. Then we opened the club downtown. And then I was like, okay, I know what I don't want in my club. And then we've really focused on creating a super safe space. Tell me a little bit more about, about your club. So originally, it was called T-Fitness. Now, we've just moved. Because of COVID, we've ended up having the luxury of taking advantage of uh, the real estate prices and moved to Young Street now. Mm-hmm. And it's called Clubhouse Toronto. Yep. And it's Where amazing. is it exactly? Uh, 643 Young Street. Is that near Bloor and Young? It's right next to Bloor and Young. Nice. Literally 45-second walk. And it's amazing to be on the longest street in the world. And it's also amazing to be in one of the top 10 most desired addresses in Canada. It's incredible. And just to think about that, even like we're actually having our grand opening in two days. And to think about that, to go from a place of such darkness and to come out and get an, and learn something in a place of darkness and to utilize that and to grow this into what we have now is phenomenal. I think we're just just scratching the surface now. You know, sometimes people think that they're going to get into a business and day one or year one, they're just going to make money. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. You peak too early. Yes. So now that myself and the team we've done a lot of the grunt work and the dirty work on our hands and knees staying there till four in the morning almost every day this week to get us ready wow people that come on board with what we do are going to have a lot easier transition right because we're not just a fitness club we're actually a social community right and the backing of it is herbalife herbalife has honestly taken me on the craziest journey in the last three years. Like I, I try to measure my three years in prison versus my three years with Herbalife. And it's amazing what you can do in that same amount of time. I've impacted so many lives by gaining weight, losing weight, self image. I've helped so many people gain confidence, feel more secure in themselves. The courtesy of, by the virtue of Herbalife, I've had the opportunity to travel to France, go to Paris. What? Go to Germany, travel to Amsterdam, meet individuals who are earning a net income on a monthly basis, a residual income of twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. I've wow. learned to be a better communicator, to be a better leader through this and build a better culture and a better community. And this is this opportunity is available to everybody. Just for the people who don't have context about Herbalife, what what is it and in what capacity are you helping them or in what capacity can other people uh, join? Of course, other people can join. So Herbalife is a, is a supplementation brand. Yeah. It's the original supplementation brand. Mm-hmm. If you're in your stores going to GNC and getting protein powders and meal replacements, we are the originator. We created the first meal replacement formula one 42 years ago wow we patented it then all these other companies came along and did all this uh version twos of what we do they might taste amazing and might be great products but we've been around longer than anybody we've stood the test of time and when i found out the founder of herbalife uh mark hughes He was an at-risk youth, just like myself. No way. His mission has been to give back and help at-risk youth. And then when I found that out, I was like, this is where I was destined to be. Because I believe in that. Now, am I 100% in a position to give back as much as I can and help the youth of my city? No. But I'm at least 40 to 60%, and I'm going to do as much as I can until I reach that 100% like he did. Because... Just because you grow up in a disenfranchised neighborhood doesn't mean you're a product of the environment. There is definitely, and I wholeheartedly believe, there is diamonds in the rough, men and women, that all they need is someone to believe in them. Yeah. All they need is a real role model. Someone to grab their hand and be like, hey man, you're bigger than this. You don't need to do this, young woman or young man. Like That lifestyle of drug dealing or for women getting into the the sex trade or whatever it is 
there's so much something more bigger, so much more safer. You just got to believe it. It's so crazy to to get out. I, I've listened to a lot of people and a lot of people say you have to believe it. And, and I, I agree. But it seems like logistically when it comes to the execution of things, to get out of the drug game, to get out of uh, of the sex trade game, to get out of a of a violent marriage, it's it's very hard to get out. I'm really curious as to your opinion. What can the government or what can we do, just like regular citizens, to help the youth? of Toronto or Scarborough or Vancouver not get into gangs? I mean, is there any policies that can be put into place? Is it more community centers? Is it more basketball courts? Is it more soccer fields? Is it changing the school curriculum? I think you have a very good take. What what could we do? So the first thing that I'm going to say is by having the opportunity to travel the last couple of years. Yeah. This isn't just a Scarborough problem or a Jane and Finch problem or a Vancouver problem. This is a global problem. There is a disenfranchised youth all over the place. Yes. And especially disenfranchised youth that are listening to hip hop music. It's almost like they're brainwashing us to all fit this. Yeah. They might be talking about it in Francais in Montreal or in uh, Spanish in, in LA or in English here in Toronto. But the mindset and what they want us to do is the same. Mm -hmm. Go out there, sell drugs, shoot each other. Hip-hop is the only genre of music. It's like systematic oppression. It is the only genre of music that teaches you to kill, teaches you to sell drugs, teaches you to disrespect women. You don't hear Taylor Swift talking like that. You don't hear Garth Brooks or Justin Timberlake. Very true. <laughs> so what, they, what I think they should do is actually censor what they put on the radio waves. I, I believe some parents think it's very cool that their eight-year-old is lip-singing a Nicki Minaj song. Your your daughter shouldn't be talking about Anaconda. She's eight years old. To each their own, what you think is right for yeah. you. But think about what you're programming your child to do. It's right? crazy. The more I read about it, the more these things do make a difference. Like what you say like neuro-linguistic programming, neuroscience, it does have an impact on what you think and in who you become. I've started for the past three years like doing affirmations, like programming myself to believe that I can do all these things and I have accomplished like so many things that I never thought would be possible. Like I went to Malaysia to do a TEDx talk. I didn't even know where Malaysia was, That's man. That's amazing. <laughs> That's insane. But I've been looking. They're doing a documentary of our of our comedy school. And I've been saying, like, I'm keeping all these pictures. I'm keeping all these flyers for our documentary. I've been saying this for, for like, a couple of years. And now they're doing a documentary on us. It's fucking crazy. That's amazing. If, if your dialogue, if your internal dialogue is, like, I'm fucking shit. I'm not good enough. I'm uh I uh I, I'm dumb. Like it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy in many ways. For sure. I'm a firm believer and I wholeheartedly believe most people shoot themselves in the foot within the first 10 minutes of their day. Because what people do, I I I actually think if I can accomplish this mission, the world would be such a better place. If we can teach everybody when they're brushing their teeth, hopefully they do it with their left hand because when you brush with your non-dominant hand, it's better for your mind. Yeah. So when I brush my teeth, not saying I do it with the left all the time, when I brush my teeth, I don't nitpick my body because people be like, oh my God, I look fat or my hair looks like this or this or that. Sit there and be like, man, I'm going to have an awesome day today. Yeah. I'm the man. Yes. I'm going to compliment six people and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And that's how I tell myself. I don't ever wake up and be like, yo, Omar, you're a piece of shit. Or, yo, you're ugly or you're fat, even if I am. Why would I do that? I'll let the world, I'll let the world have their opinion on me. I know I'm going to tell myself what I'm going to tell myself. That's so good. I, I always say the world is a tough place already in many ways. Why would you be a... Like, if, if you had a friend that talked to you the same way you, to, you talked to you, would you be their friend? Probably not. 
So treat yourself right. Like treat yourself well. Treat yourself. Treat others the way you want yourself to be treated. Right. So I always try to compliment people randomly. Some one thing I realized: some people don't know how to take a compliment. It's actually crazy. Yeah. It's like, hey, oh, they nice, deflect it. Nice shirt, or if you tell a woman, hey, nice nails. Oh, I need to get them done. No, just take the compliment so for what it true. is and roll forward. Right. Don't 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 nitpick. Just be like, oh, thanks, man. I don't know where I heard this, but I think it was the Tim Ferriss podcast. But if you get criticized, something negative, it takes people like one second to internalize it. Like immediately, people like uh, the average person, uh, and you remember that. But if you get a compliment, people like deflect it, and for you to be able to internalize the compliment. The the, the article, confidence. yeah, it takes like ten ten to fifteen seconds. You gotta sit with it. You gotta acknowledge it, and people tend to deflect it, so they never really internalize. All their internal dialogue is, "Oh, people say I'm fat. People say I'm this. I'm that. I'm that. My work is not good enough. My essay wasn't good enough." Because they, as as uh, humans, the study said, you internalize the criticism in one second, but to be able to get the the compliment, you gotta sit with it. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yes, I think I look good today. I, I I love myself. Or like 10 seconds of you really taking it in. For you to so be able funny. to keep it with you. I didn't know that. But it makes sense. Me, I'm the total opposite. <laughs> I love you, you criticize me, I'm going to be like, okay. That's what this individual said. This is what I believe. Then I'll ask for a third opinion sometimes. Then I'll be like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. You tell me I look good or I'm dressed well. I'll be like, I know, like. That's what I was supposed to do today. You look good in a suit, I know. So I don't ever focus on compliments for myself because that's what I was supposed to do. You strike me as as a type of guy who has is so sure of who you are. 100%. That it is very easy to get a job done cuz you don't get you don't get sidetracked by criticism easily like you're just like i know who i am i'm gonna get the job done and because you've endured things in your childhood and you felt like the man of the house at age six at age 10 at age 12 you've always undertaken this role of leadership when i look at myself having moved in to five different places I've had to uh, adopt a survival mechanism of I'm by myself. I need to get it done and failure is not an option. But the shadow of it, the weakness of my strength, the shadow of my strength is that whenever I get criticized or whenever something happens, my initial like like gut reaction is like, I don't need you guys. I've been by myself this entire time good. I've done everything I've done by myself. I've moved by myself. You, like John Smith, you were you weren't here when I was six. You weren't here when I was twelve. Yeah. I don't need you. But the shadow of that strength of the of the resiliency and consistency and discipline and laser sharp like proactiveness and getting the job doneness. Yeah. Is that I don't like to ask for help because I don't like to re- rely on other people. Has that happened to you? So when I used to run my, uh, when I used to live my alternative lifestyle, I just used to rely on myself. I didn't have a team of individuals I was working with. Like I had friends and we would work together, but we wouldn't work together if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Because I would do everything on my own. And now that I came on board and by the virtue of my business partner, she's taught me it's okay to ask for help. That's why we have a team. Because the way that we've run our business and the way the Herbalife community and the business runs, you're not getting paid a salary or an hourly wage. You're there because you want to build something for yourself and you see something bigger. Right? Yeah. So there was four of us at the club yesterday. There's going to be four of us there. We have like our own chat group. And I messaged them today. I was like, amazing work we've done, ladies. We're in the home stretch. Today we got to do this, this, and this, and I put like a mo- um, like a fire sign based on how important it is. Yeah. And then another team member responded, we also have to add this, this, and this. 
And that's how we work together. There's nothing wrong with asking for help or delegating. You just got to know how to do it and accept it. But I, I also it. understand where you don't want to rely on people because I go through that. And typically I'll give an individual, hey, can you do this? They mess up. Okay. Second opportunity. Cool. You mess up. I'm not going to ask you a third time. Yeah. If, and now if you come and tell me, hey, Yamar, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to ask or clarify if, you, if you've done it. If you don't do it, that's instantaneously. I understand your characteristics. You're just one of those individuals who will say something for fluff or say something to, because it sounds good, yeah. and not follow through. Know that I have a mental tech check mark on how to address that going forward. Then I'll just keep it for myself and I'll do the work myself. So I understand fully where you're coming from. It's hard to rely yeah. on people because... People want to say the right thing, but don't want to do the right thing. Right. And I think coming from, obviously, you grew up here in, in, in Scarborough, and I grew up in Costa Rica, and I, I'm, and I didn't have, like, a rough childhood by any means. Like, my parents are, uh, it, it was a, like, there were some, cert, like, numerous events that were tough in my life, and the surroundings at times were not as healthy but my my parents are great people i had a great education and i love them now the thing is i feel like at numerous times in my life i've been let down by people that i loved and some things didn't go as i would have wanted them to which was out of my control so i'm in many ways hardwired to not want to rely on people and now, because I have that self-awareness, I am willing to ask for help now because I know that I am not as good a leader, as good a father, as good a husband if I, can do, if I think I can do everything by myself. I've become really good at delegating because now I have that self-awareness of where I'm coming from. Like my, my, defense, mechanism, my defense mechanism is I don't need you guys. But now, because I... That helped me survive. That was my winning formula back in yeah. the day. When I moved around, when I went to boarding school, when I had to make friends because I, I, I didn't have, I moved countries or I, I was in a new job or that was my defense mechanism. I, I needed to, to quickly adapt. So because I've been self-sufficient in many ways, it's, it's hard to ask, it's hard to delegate. But now I do it a lot more because I have that self-awareness that it became a weakness of my strength. That's phenomenal uh, self-awareness, like you mentioned before. And to be that self-aware and know that that's who you used to be and who you are now is different. Because now you have, I think you have a son, right? Yeah. So Liam. now you got to lead by example. Yeah. So now you're going to be like, hey, son, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to do this, right? Because you know that you can get it done as a team. If I, I think teaching your child to be a leader, but also a team player, is phenomenal. Right. You are you're a husband. You now and you have two kids. Yeah, dude it it changes you in many ways, and it doesn't change you in others because you are who you are. But the playing field has changed because now you got two kids. You're a husband. Because you were forced to take this role as the man of the house, um, it seems to me that you were forced to have responsibilities which were not typical for an 8, 10, 12-year-old. Did that translate into being really picky to have a partner? Did that translate into having commitment issues? Do you kind of, when you look back and you're like, oh, that's why I'm like, I am now as a husband, because in many ways, I was a husband as a kid already. Did, ha, did it impact you, what you went through as a kid, to who you are as a husband now? Okay. So, prior, you said you said your life wasn't that difficult. So, I just want to say, everything that I went through, shelter, this, that, and the third, I don't think my life was that bad. I think my life was great. I think Canada has a phenom Canada has a phenomenal system for young men and women that are looking to get out of a trouble situation. They'll yeah. help you. I love Canada for that. 
And my sister had mentioned, she goes, you didn't even have a normal childhood. I go, I'm okay with that. As long as my kids have a normal childhood. So we put a huge emphasis on giving them the things or experiences that we didn't have, which is our obligation as a parents or as an aunt, right? Yeah. And because I treated my sisters like my kids, I've been very hard on them too. Yeah. Right? So I learned how to deal with my kids at um, much better because I already practiced with my sisters, right? But at that time, when I was being like a father figure slash brother to my sisters, I was living a totally different lifestyle. I was very strict, like, hey, you can't be outside because I was always afraid if... I wasn't afraid for myself. You might not come get me, but you might get someone close to me. Yeah. So I never believed in taking pictures of any of my family, no pictures of my house and of my family. Like I was very, very like, you, nobody's going to know who they are. And when I ended up in a relationship, I think this is just my own theory. When you grow up in a single parent household and there was a turbulent situation, you look for love as a young man or a woman and you end up in relationships and... In the 90s, you might have noticed there was like an influx of teen parenting. Yes. Right? That's because I believe that those parents wanted to have kids so they could almost correct the mistakes that happened in their house. Does that make sense? We want to give love because we didn't give love. We didn't get love. Yeah. So I ended up uh, in a relationship very young with somebody like a little bit older and... I realized I was going to go on this left path. I was like, hey, you're on your way to become a a doctor. You don't need to be with someone that's about to become a street pharmacist. You got to go your own way. I'm going my own way. Left that alone. And then just, I don't think I could trust anybody when I was in relationships. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Then it's like, okay, I live this illicit lifestyle, but I'm not going to tell you about my lifestyle. I remember I had a girlfriend. She didn't even know my real name for six months. What? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean she didn't know your real name? Because just uh, when you live that lifestyle, you're out so much, and it's not necessarily you're out clubbing, but you're out communicating, and you see somebody, and you see somebody. Hey, how are you doing? Da 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 da. You didn't think it's going to turn into a relationship. Yeah. So I kind of fell into it. Then I was just like, you know what, man, I gotta bite the bullet. Like, hey, this isn't my real name. This is my real name. She's so like, so you, oh, okay. you had like a nickname? I had an alias. Yes. Oh. So I, I just used my uh, name for my alternative lifestyle as my name f- that I would give to women. So they would call me Chris because Chris, <laughs> if, if the authorities are ever tapping your phone, Chris can be anybody. It can be a white guy, a black guy, an Asian guy, a Spanish guy, anybody. Yeah. So I picked a very neutral name and I would give that to people. And then I was just like, okay, this isn't <laughs> my name. So I kind of built trust. and But then through relationships, I think when you're younger, you're more in love with the idea of being in love than being in love so true so So i went through the the relationship cycles just like everybody else and then finally got an understanding of what love is and what kind of love that i want and what kind of love can i give for me giving love is probably like super hard because i love everybody i treat them respectfully but like to let somebody in into my like deep like you know like how they draw that heart sh- heart shape yeah to get into that little the little part of the iceberg that's at the bottom is very difficult i believe that comes with time even telling somebody you love them in a month or two sounds like like insane for me because that word is so powerful like love is just thrown around people will become employees or co-workers oh i love you honey see you later and in my mind i'm like you've just devalued such a powerful oh, word so good yeah. so me i use that word very seldomly like the 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 women that i have loved or been in love with i've told them at a much later time just because you say it doesn't mean i'm going to say it back but you might hear it once every three four five six months and I do mean it because it's with good intention. Yeah. Right? But I also learned because you love one person and another person, it's a different type of love. Because you need to have relationship experiences to know the type of relationship you need for the long haul. You can't settle. 
There's right. nothing wrong with the high school relationship or getting into a relationship in college university, but by the time you finish college university, you and her mindset's very different. Yeah, very, very true. And then some people settle because, oh, I've been with her for five years or two years. It's just the next step. Yeah, It's yeah. just the next step, but you guys are on a different plane, and you already knew that going in, but you stayed together because of time. I believe... And I'm not trying to be sexist. It's the man's responsibility to be like, hey, I love you. We're amazing together. But your mindset and my mindset and what we're looking for in the future is different. Let's not force it and move forward and be friends. And you actually look for who's going to make you happy so you don't end up in a divorce. And I'll do the same. But people don't want to have those conversations because people are afraid of hurting somebody's feelings. But you're protecting them for the long run. Mm -hmm. So I realized because of my lifestyles, because of my lifestyle, if I was getting too close to somebody, I would, I would break away from them. Mm -hmm. Because I don't imagine having a girlfriend going to prison or having a kid while I'm while you're in prison. Like what? I would lose my mind. Yeah, what Alejandro went through that he talked about, man. There's a lot of a lot of young men make that decision, and they have to live with it. And some parents are cool with meeting their kids in there and they make that decision. Like, I got a kid, but I'm going to go and live this lifestyle. The ROI at this time and point, you could not convince me. Like, hey, Amar, you're going to make a million dollars a year and you're going to go to prison for five years. Or you have the possibility. You could not come to me with that on the table. It's not, no way, no how. Yeah, it seems like a million, and I'm not trying to sound cocky, but it's not that much money. Not anymore. Not anymore to... To forfeit experiences that you're never going to get back. Uh, when I was listening to you talk, I I was thinking about something that I've been going through lately that maybe you can relate. I felt recently that while my parents have been fantastic and, and are fantastic and everything, I've... I have sort of a deep resentment for feeling alone. Like I've felt alone for most of my life in many ways. Uh, they they did the best that they can. And I had a, a great childhood in, in pockets of my life. But so when I was six, my parents divorced. When I was 10, I went to live with my dad and ha but... It had a great situation in El Salvador, loving family, loving household with my dad and my stepmom, but I didn't have my mom. And I went to see her on vacation, but, and my brothers, I didn't have my brothers, I, I did have my little sisters. And, and then I went to Mexico, so it was like saying goodbyes many times. Then I went to boarding school, which I loved, by the way, just an incredible opportunity in Quebec that, really shaped who, who I am. So you went from South America to a boarding school in Canada. Exactly. Wow, kudos to your parents, man. Yeah, no, they, they, are, they are fantastic people. But recently, I've been, feeling, I've been feeling alone. Like, for the first time, I feel, I feel like I have a home. And, I mean, not for the first time. I, I obviously have had a home, but I feel like Canada is home because of my wife and my son now. And I feel alone because I'm like, fuck, I have to go down to Costa Rica or Tampa to see my dad or Peru to see my mom, and my grandma. And like, dude, if I, if I don't, they won't come up or they haven't come up. And it, like, I want my son to have a family. And I realized by talking to a friend that because I've said goodbye so many times when I was a kid and, and just my life has been an incredible set of goodbyes that I've become numb to goodbyes. And I'm just like, okay, on to the next one. Let's go on to the next project, on to the next. So that can be a strength in a specific context when you need to get stuff done, the projects, everything, and you're not um, moved by easily by events. But the weakness of the strength is that you're numb. Like you, you don't really uh, connect easily emotionally. You don't, you don't say I love you as much. You don't ask your parents to for for favors or you don't you don't tell your brothers that you love them as much. So I now that I have that self awareness, I've I, I wanna work on it. Have have you had that experience of becoming numb to goodbyes 
and not being moved easily by emotions or not wanting to ask favor to to your family? Uh, definitely. Now, one thing I'll ask you, you have two older brothers and two younger sisters? Correct. So you're the middle child. Cor- yeah, my mom and my dad, it's three boys. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, the three boys right here. Yeah. And then my, yeah, the three boys. Yeah. And then my two little sisters are my stepmom and my dad. But my, they're my sisters. Like, but I grew up with them. Yeah. So you're the middle child. Yeah, I'm the middle child. So they say typically the middle child typically feels alone. And I'll tell you why. The oldest will always get a lot of attention, and the baby is the baby. Yeah. Right? And then at one point, they will believe the middle child is old enough and doesn't need as much attention. So they're typically the lone wolf, like myself. You're the middle? No, no. I'm the oh. eldest, oh, but yeah, I've yeah. always considered myself a lone wolf. Like, I don't really ask my family for favors. Me or, neither. And it's not that I can't rely on them. I just don't need them to do it. And there's nothing wrong with that, wholeheartedly. And you're in a position to go and visit them. That's amazing. And you can't be mad at them because they're not in a position to visit you. That's just how the cookie crumbles. I mean, they are in a position. And they just choose not to. I mean, they didn't have to because I was single and I would always, like, go and visit them. And logistically, like, it's my brother and my other brother in Costa Rica with, like, all my nephews and nieces. So because I left, it's like kind of on me to go visit them. But now... It's because when we live abroad, people think that, oh my God, you live in Canada or America yeah. or Britain. Yes. That you're, you're just rolled you're just paved with gold and yeah. you're making this infl- It's not like that. Yeah, it's you not. You come here, you got to struggle. So it's awesome that you take that time. And if they come, they come. If they don't, they don't. They know that 100%. you love them. Know that you love them and they love you. Yeah, 100%. Right? So I haven't, I don't really typically ask for favors. I learned early on because of the lifestyle that I was living, I was almost kind of shunned by my family because they were so conservative. Like, oh my God, our nephew's doing this. Like, we love you, but we don't know how to deal with you. So I I had to figure it out on my own. I feel there is though an aspect of, because they always perceived me as like, he's 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 got it under control, that... Even if they want to help me, or I I need their help, or I want their help, or I want them to come visit me, they won't even dare ask because I I've I've had this armor on for so long that I got it under control. Gift and the curse. Exactly the weakness of the strength. So when Liam was born, yeah, for uh, Venez like my wife's parents because they're Venezuelan. Because of the passports and the visa, they weren't able to come for Liam's birth and help my wife and help us. Venezuela is hard. Yeah, very, it's very difficult hard. country. So we didn't want... I mean, it's it's a hectic time to have a baby. So we wanted some help. And I was looking, I'm like, man... You have I no ask? family support here? No, it's just me. Okay. So I'm like, my dad is busy. Like, he's working. My mom would never come. She's got her own things in Peru. So I'm like... I'm like, oh, whatever. She's going to say no. But I'm like, mom, do you want to come to help us when Liam is born? And she's like, yes, <laughs> of course. Oh, my God. Mommy. And I'm like, what? You want to come? That's like, amazing. you want to? But that's the, the, the weakness of the strength. Like, you're I just so used to not asking. Never imagine that she wanted to come. But that's like, that's her grandson. Yeah. She just jumped all over the opportunity. That's just, amazing. But. It's fascinating to think that because we're so independent, we've always held it together, yeah. which could be, in a specific context, a strength. It could be a weakness of the strength that you... Ne- Imagine if my mom wouldn't have been here. That is like the opportunity of a lifetime that I never even considered because I didn't have the self-awareness that my defense mechanism is i don't need you guys i'm good i'm good by myself so so, like it's not that we need the help but it's like beautiful life moments to to have them around you i think because of the the exit of my my father growing up i've always been very it's been very easy to compartmentalize and like okay you guys don't want to help or you don't need this or because i was shunned I've always been very easy with uh, with an influx of things that have to do with emotion and family. Now, do I want that for my children? No. 
I want my children to have certain characteristics of me, and then I definitely want them to be more sensitive and more caring and more loving. Not to say that I'm not, but I want them to display it because in a world of extreme insecurities and extreme, how would I describe it? Where you're always on your screen and you're by yourself, people need good communicators. And not just like, hey, tune into my Instagram channel or my YouTube channel and we're going to communicate. No, people need in-person communication yeah. skills. But people lack that. People can text you to death. Yes. People can FaceTime you for hours. But when you get to them in person, it's like watching paint dry because they don't know what to say because there's not a screen. <laughs> yes. So I'm trying to teach my kids to be high communicators. I love it. I love it. I want to ask you about you opening a private career college with your mom. I thought that was that's beautiful. She's always had a passion for helping women from all backgrounds, if even if they're immigrant, single parents, Canadian, white, black, Latino. How did this idea come about, and what did it mean for the both of you? Oh, uh, man. So as I mentioned prior, we lived in a shelter. And then when we came out of the shelter... It's not like my mom had a higher education at that point. She did go back for college. Wow. And um, yeah, she graduated college. I, I didn't, unfortunately, but it's okay. My kids will. And um, so she went, when we came out of the shelter, she actually worked for the South Asian Women's Center in Scarborough. And there was other battered women or domestic uh, violent situations. These women came together and they were helping other women. So imagine being an immigrant single parent helping other single parents so she's had a passion from it she's always believed in giving back or because i've survived it she has the strength or the education and the knowledge to help other women yeah so the biggest hurdle that my, i asked my mom I was like how can we help people right like i used to sponsor a child back when i was like 2021 20, like the world uh world life or one of those uh programs yeah so I tried to do it on a small scale, try to like kind of wash my conscience, I guess. <laughs> but she was like, hey, we should help people and help women. I was like, how do we do that? She goes, the biggest thing when a woman comes out of a situation is she has no career opportunity. Or she so needs to learn true. a new skill. Or if she's an immigrant, imagine coming from a war and torn country and you're in a barren where abuse is okay. Physical and um, domestic violence is okay in third world countries it's not okay but it's accepted yeah but when you come to canada it's not accepted and you yeah. shouldn't accept it now you have the power to strengthen the support and the resources to break away from that turbulent situation so you can protect your most valuable asset and your kids so once they break away or if they leave they can come to us and we can help them but this opportunity in comes in terms of the private carrier college isn't just for battered women it's for all women and men looking for a second opportunity, a new career, right? So opening that with my mom and us turning it into a family business and expanding it is, is going to be amazing. Like my sister also is in there as well. So they obviously have an age gap and we're talking about a logo recently and I was telling my sister, I was like, listen, our mom created something with a concept of hers you're going to be the one that takes over along with myself and we're going to propel it into the next generation. So do what you think is right. Also mm -hmm. not to say that because we go against what my mom says, but her values and mindset is not going to connect with the values and mindset of somebody younger. She has that skill set of making a woman feel comfortable and understanding her. My sister can make somebody feel comfortable, but she doesn't know how it is to be a single mom. Yeah. So she has her own skill set where she can relate to this generation of women who's kind of lost, who's messed up in university, or is looking for answers. Come, we'll help you. She also understands the power of social media, which my mom understands, but doesn't know how to implement. Yeah. Right? So these different skill sets, right? Like... Having my mom and my sister and everybody working together has been phenomenal. And we just actually recently, with we partnered up with a charity, we worked together at Kicks for Kids. So we donated about 111 backpacks. Wow. And one of the assignment that myself and Maria had was a, a drop-off center 
at a battered women's shelter. And I was like, hey, I, I, I lived in one of these in a different area growing up. And I was like, we have the, I go, I have an esthetician school, a private career college where we can take your women and actually help them get a second career or learn a skill set where they can leave the province. Because the courses that we teach, such as the PSW course, the aesthetics course. What's PSW? A personal support worker. And those are much needed throughout Canada because yeah. of COVID for seniors. That's a 25 to $35 paying, dollar an hour paying job. Without having a higher education, you just got to come learn the program. And then you can take that and go to Alberta, leave your situation. Oof. Right? So everything is slowly coming together. And as we grow our team we grow our mindset and the opportunities present themselves we're going to be able to help a lot more for more women and youth that's a beautiful initiative if if people wanted to get involved or donate to the private career college that you and your mom and your sister have where would they go to is there a website do they contact you Definitely. directly um, so you can contact me directly. That's for sure. Um, I guess the Instagram handles and stuff will be displayed at the end. But if you're looking for the private carrier college, it's Taha College, T A H A College, and you can you will be able to find us on Google search, and then you can just go from there. Contact us directly. You can contact me directly. But there is a will or a way to find us if you're actually looking to make a change. Yeah, we'll put everything, all of these, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. You've also um, done a lot of charity. Yeah. And you do, you do Healthy Hearts Communi uh, Community Nutrition Club. You do the Kicks for Kids. Which one is closest to heart to you? So, it all depends so I used to either I had, I, I wouldn't have an influx of clothes going to school. If you're wearing LA gears with the shoes with the flashing light, I'm going to have the knockoff version. If you have six pairs of pants to go to school, I'm going to have two pairs of pants to go to school. So I understand the clothing aspect of it, but I also know how it feels to go to school and not have breakfast on the way there. Right? Because I'd have friends that they didn't have breakfast and I would share my breakfast or my snack with them when I was a kid. Because they're like, yo, I didn't eat breakfast. How do you function? Yeah. So I wholeheartedly believe, and I looked it up, it's a study. Most kids in North America go to school hungry. Some don't have the opportunity for breakfast, and some just don't eat breakfast because their parents don't eat breakfast. So monkey see, monkey do. Yeah. So I want to put a huge emphasis on providing a, a nutritious meal or a supplement or a meal replacement for kids to take before they go to school so they can function and become the leaders that they need to become or become the community pillars that they need to become instead of just, oh, that kid's stupid or, or that kid doesn't pay attention. No, teacher, that kid is hungry and doesn't have the fuel <coughs> in his body to fuel his brain. So it's not that it's one incredible. outweighs the other. They're both the same because we're helping in one way or another, but yeah. I believe providing like nutrition is very, very essential for young kids. I love it. Maybe I obviously because you know Herbalife so well that could play in the part like the supplement Definitely. Or nutrition. We actually partnered up with a local musician on his birthday. He donated, I believe, twelve bikes, and we we stepped in and provided six hundred meals. Wow! For the neighborhood, and what we're looking to do since there's a, a Toronto's music scene is huge. Yeah, we have so many disenfranchised neighborhoods. I would love to partner up with different musicians or entertainers or people who have come from disenfranchised neighborhoods and we reach out to them we partner up with the community centers we know because they typically have a hot list of the families in need we would love to work with those families in need let's provide let's take one thing off of that parent's shoulders oh i love that and it might just be one box of meal replacement or 30 meals however you want to break it down but it goes a long way. Just the same way providing a backpack for a young man or woman that's going to school goes a long way, especially for someone who's cash strapped. Yeah. School is a time of excitement for kids, but for some parents, it's like, oh, shoot, how do I do this? And they got a plan for their kids back to school shopping in April. 
the smart ones. They start putting away $25 a week and they got a pre-plan so they have enough money to take care of their one kid or two kids or three kids. So true. So just giving back in any which way is amazing. Like what we did with Kicks for Kids, oh man, it puts such a smile on my face, man. I I just can't even imagine how good it felt for those kids to be like, oh my God, like we're going to wear new shoes or we're going to wear not have to wear last year's shoes because they're too small. Or we get to wear a name brand shoe or have a nice backpack and to provide like a hundred dollar solution for that family, man, that mom or dad must be like, okay, man, that's amazing. Now we can take this hundred bucks and we can pay off our, our credit card or we can put it towards our car or you know what? We can put it in their savings. So this was year one with Kicks for Kids. And the Healthy Hearts Breakfast Nutrition Club, we're going to get that off the ground once we're all settled with the clubhouse. So the focus is going to expand once we get one thing settled and then we can continue to build. Dude, if there's anything I can do to help on the next Kicks for Kids or any of the other charity initiatives, let me know. For the launch of Clubhouse Toronto, let me know. I'll put it on my social media, anything I can do to help. And uh, as we come to the end of this interview... Uh, the champagne question, which is the last question that every guest gets. If we were to meet a year from now, 2022, with a bottle of champagne, what are we celebrating in Amara's life? What are we celebrating in Amara's life? The expansion of the team. The clubhouse team or any of your other ventures? Just as... In, in general, because if I could, if we help 5,000 kids in the next year, that's what I want to celebrate. If I can grow the, the Herbal Life team and we have people that don't have a higher education or tired of their, their desk job or that single mom that needs to provide an alternative income and we've helped an influx of people build their own business, become their own boss, or they come to the academy and learn a skill set and open their own salon or become a PSW and get out of their shitty situation and and just I just want to provide solutions. Yeah. So the more lives that I impact, that's what we're celebrating. The impacting of more lives. It's not something for myself like, oh, I bought an Aston Martin, which I plan to one day. I don't I don't care about those those things. I've had the nice cars. I want to celebrate the growth of others. That's the biggest thing for me. If I can make a million and give away seven hundred thousand and take that 300000 and invest it in myself, I'm winning. Love because it. Because money is, it comes and goes. But if I can take that capital and give it to others, that's the p- real power for me. I love it, man. L- l- man, so much respect to you and your story. It seems to me that, and what I admire the most about you is that you have always, especially now, known who you are and you weren't deeply impacted. It didn't, I mean, it did shape who you are, but it didn't scar you for life, having gone through all these experiences. And and you always had, like, yeah, I'm not a gangster. I'm not, uh, like, what society tells me because I was in prison. I'm not this. I'm not that. I know who I am. I'm going to be a great businessman husband father friend so man respect to you and 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 thank you so much for being here opening up i'm really excited for everyone to hear your story thank you very much big hung man amar and stefan on the stefan dyer podcast Chao, chao. Gracias por escuchar el Stefan Dyer Podcast. Arrivederci, my people.